here in Kansas City at the 2017 uh, meetings of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Edward J. Uh, Latessa of the University of Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, I, we're going to share a little bit about um, Ed's life and career uh, for the oral history project uh, that ACJS is engaged in. Uh, in 1976, uh, Ed earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Humanities Education from The Ohio State University. He followed this up with a Master's of Arts in Public Affairs in 1977, uh, then a PhD in 1979, also in Public Affairs, uh, both from the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University. Uh, after graduation in 1979, uh, Ed accepted his first academic appointment, serving as assistant professor of criminal justice at the University of Alabama in Birmingham until 1980. Uh, in the fall of 1980, Ed began what would turn out to be a long and transformative period at the University of Cincinnati, where he remains today. After joining the criminal justice faculty at the University of Cincinnati, um, Ed continued his research agenda and scholarship in the general area of corrections, earning promotion and tenure in 1984. Of particular note was Ed's service as the head of what was then the Division of Criminal Justice, um, beginning in 1985. Since that time, the criminal justice programming in various significant aspects, as we'll hear, um, has grown. Uh, today, Ed serves as the director of the School of Criminal Justice, which is situated within what is now the College of Education, Criminal Justice, and Human Services. In addition, within the School of Criminal Justice are several research centers and academic programs, which you'll hear about shortly. Uh, Ed's research, scholarship, and other professional activity has and continues to appear in the field's top peer-reviewed journals. In addition, Ed's work has been recognized by the receipt of several awards, uh, too many, frankly, to mention uh, within this interview, but of particular note, I wanted to highlight the uh, Bruce Smith Award from the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, uh, the Marguerite Q. Warren and Ted B. Palmer Award from the American Society of Criminology, uh, the Margaret Mead Award from the International Community Corrections Association, the Peter B. Legions Award uh, from the uh, American Correctional Association, and the Simon Dennett's Award from the Ohio Community Corrections Organization, among many, many others. Ed has also served uh, both the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences and the American Society of Criminology in leadership roles, perhaps most notably as president of ACJS from 1989 to 1990. In terms of his areas of research and concentration, uh, Ed, of course, has worked extensively in corrections, both within the US and internationally. Of particular note has been his work in the very broad and in inclusive paradigm of uh, evidence-based practices in correctional intervention. For the last 30 or more years, uh, just about any student of corrections has certainly seen evidence of Ed's efforts towards investigating, testing, and developing several areas of correctional intervention. Uh, likewise, tens of thousands of correctional administrators, practitioners, policymakers, and politicians across the country have been in attendance at any number of seminars and workshops and conferences that Ed speaks at nearly constantly. And that's to say nothing of Ed's increasingly frequent invitations to speak overseas. Uh, from the beginning of his scholarly career in the mid-1970s uh, to today, 40 years later, Ed has recognized the need for transformation in the field of corrections. He has worked tirelessly to identify ways in which the field of corrections needs to change in order to become more humane, more rehabilitative, more professional, and less expensive. As such, it is a real pleasure uh, to have been asked to take part in this oral history project where we'll have a chance to listen to Ed illuminate some of what I've touched on earlier and more. So thank you for being here today. Um, Ed, uh, could you tell us a little bit about you know, your life before you decided to pursue um, academics as a career? Well, I, uh, I was born and raised in uh, Youngstown, Ohio. And Youngstown is an old steel town in the uh, northeast uh, part of the state. Uh, I grew up in a very um, working class neighborhood. Uh, <coughs> went to public schools in Youngstown. Um, I actually worked in steel mills when I was young. And so it was a, uh, there was nothing particularly unique about it other than Youngstown is known as a kind of a tough town and uh, had a lot of tough friends, and a lot of people that got into trouble, uh, including myself at various times. And so um, 
I, I think I always, as I think back, of course you don't realize it when you're young, but I, I think those years helped shape my, my thoughts about criminal behavior and about delinquency and about some of our efforts to, uh, to reform and, and rehabilitate. And uh, I'll just tell a quick story. Uh, I had a friend, he was a little bit older than I was. He was a very, very tough uh, <clears throat> uh, guy. And uh, he, would, he would get in a lot of fights at school. And I mean, you know, pretty serious stuff. And one time he got thrown in a detention home for, for about two weeks. And I remember he came out and I, and I said to him, uh, what was it like? You know, I mean, you're in detention. And he said, well, it wasn't bad. He said, you know, we had boxing. And he said, and the staff loved me. He said, I beat the hell out of every kid they put in the ring. And he said, I got extra food for that. Yeah. And, I, and when I was a kid, I thought, well, that was pretty cool. Right? Years later, he, uh, uh, he killed, uh, killed someone and killed himself in a, in a very kind of uh, uh, tragic uh, uh, event. Uh, and, and as I look back on that, and I think, you know, those staff didn't think what they were doing was wrong. We were trying to keep these kids, you know, engaged, uh, uh, give them some athletics. Mm -hmm. But in fact, what they were reinforcing was this aggressive behavior that he had. And uh, I've tried to work over the years to change what we do in programs so that we're not doing that kind of harm anymore. Aside from aside from that example and, and probably some others uh, that, that you could could talk about as well, what what is it about criminal justice and criminology overall that, that, that sparked your interest? Is there anything from the academic side that drew you in? No, I, I you know when I went to Ohio State and, and we didn't have a lot of money and and I probably couldn't have gone away to school, but I had an uncle who was a professor at Ohio State, and he uh, he and my aunt offered to allow me to live with them. So I was able to go to Ohio State. That tremendously influenced me. Uh, I remember taking early on a couple classes. Um, uh, Cy Dennett was a professor of mine, uh, a guy named Joe Scott. And, uh, you know, Cy had the ability, there could be a thousand students in the room, but you always thought he was talking to you. And, and I always thought, you know, I want to be that kind of professor. And, uh, and of course, I had an interest in it. I, again, as I said, I, I, I knew something about it from the other side. Mm -hmm. um, but I really didn't have any plans in my, uh, certainly my undergraduate uh, 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 pursuits to, to go into the field. There was nothing, you know, I, I'm always amazed. Some kids seem to know right away, and, you know, they come into college, I want to do this. I was like many students. I, I just didn't know. I tried a couple different majors, um, and and so I, in some ways, I fell into uh, into the field. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was you know, I was a senior, and you know nothing. There was no internet then, so everything was on a bulletin board, and they had this cards that if you were interested in uh, public administration and public policy, uh, you send it in, and they'd send you information and. I must have checked the box that said corrections or criminal justice on it because I got admitted a master's program and one day I got a call from uh, uh, Harry Allen who was my mentor and he said well I'm your advisor mm -hmm. and, and uh, why don't you come meet with me. So uh, there was no grand plan here. It was pretty much you know, and then he hired me, and you know, kind of rest is history. So Harry so. Allen, Julianne, are there are there other are there other mentors besides Harry Allen, who is your primary mentor? Yeah, you know, and I'm a big I'm a big believer in uh, social learning. I really believe that most of us um, identify people that we emulate and and try to be like good and bad. Uh, in my case, my uncle um, was a great influence on me. He was a big professor at Ohio State, chair of the department, um, very well known in his field, and and you know, without knowing it, you know, I I wanted to become like him. He was always my favorite uncle. And then I met Harry, and, and Harry was kind of a, a mystery guy. He had a big research center. He traveled a lot. We did a lot of projects, a lot of grants, and. I remember Harry smoked a pipe in, in those days. You could smoke. And so we all started smoking pipes. And I remember sitting in an office turning green and thinking, why the hell am I doing this, right? But we all wanted to be Harry, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, that, that, 
that those influence of those people, mm -hmm. that and the friends I left behind, the people I knew that some of whom in ended up, yeah, yeah, that ended up in prison or ended up worse. Um, I always, you know, I had an intuitive sense of what they dealt with and what they went through and the kind of lives that they uh, that they lived. So I, I think there were those influences that kind of drove drove me into it. Once, once you had, uh, once you had 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 fallen into and, and made the decision to pursue criminal justice, uh, were there any any ideas early on uh, that really sparked your interest from an academic standpoint? Yeah, I, well, I remember early on, and and the we work would, that Harry was doing or other things. Yeah, other projects and, when we were ta we were doing a lot of um, in those days. There was a lot of LEAA money. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to have an evaluation done. Harry ran a big soft money shop. And so we worked on the projects, whatever projects we were assigned to, and 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 uh, we. But we also took a lot of our classes out of uh, criminology in the social department. So we had we had a lot of work there. And this was in the you got to remember now. This is in the you know mid to late seventies. And and one day Harry brought Bob Martinson in. Uh, to do a colloquium or something, and and we all got to meet Bob Martinson. Of course, we all knew about uh, Martinson's work, um, and and even at that point, I had a sense from evaluating programs that that he was missing the mark, that um, he probably got it right in that most of what we were doing wasn't very effective, but I also knew from the studies that some things were working. And uh, of course, it, I was young then, and I just did whatever somebody told me to do. But uh, I, I think those were the early seeds of kind of this real interest in corrections. Harry had worked, you know, Harry was focused in corrections, so that's what we did. We we worked in corrections. Uh, had he been in policing, I probably would have been studying policing. So it, it wasn't, you know. Uh, when you're a graduate student, especially if you don't have any money, you know, and you end up working for somebody, you kind of do what, what what they're doing, yeah. and and that's of course that's what you that's did what because did, you yeah. were my student, yeah. and and if I had a project, you know, you didn't say well, I don't think I'm going to do that, you know, you said okay, we'll okay. start. Yeah. So yeah, what's um. Uh, when you th when you think about you know I, I, I tried to touch on a, a little bit about sort of the seeds at the beginning <coughs> of, of your career but mm -hmm. how would you uh, how would you characterize you know your your work your life's work in terms of overall themes well I, I think there are themes um, and, and I always tell my students you know that that, that one of the why you know academia is such a great place to have a career is you can do lots of things mm -hmm. and you can you can do them over time and change I think my first theme when I got out was um, you know uh, teaching and, and, and honing my teaching skills uh, I got involved in, in uh, ACJS and ASC so I, I had that professional uh, organizations I was involved with and, and, and kind of building a program. We were starting to build a, a, a program. But as time went on, I started to shift to more uh, funded research. Mm -hmm. uh, once we got a doctoral program, I understood the importance of funding students. And so, I, and, and, and at that point, I started doing a lot more consulting and work in the field um, and, and, and working with agencies. Mm -hmm less work with professional academic organizations and more work with professional yeah. practitioner organizations. I started going to ACA and APPA and mm -hmm. lecturing there and and so but and then of course the administrative side you know I was I've been department head for a long time I was interim dean for a year so I got to do it all. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of my academic work I think the 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 early seeds of what works didn't come together for a long time and 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 you know in the old days somebody would get a grant or, or get a start a new project some local agency and they'd call me and they want me to come do an evaluation and 
you know, we'd go in and worry about the design and the comparison group and more often than, you know, and if the program worked, everybody was happy. You know, if we found some positive findings. If it didn't work, of course, it was my fault, you know, as a researcher. <laughs> uh, but we, we didn't look inside the box of the program. Right. We just, just, we trusted that they trusted knew what they, they, knew they, were, what they doing, were doing, yeah. right? Yeah. And it really started with, uh, yeah, and of course, Frank Collin joined the faculty, and Frank was a big advocate of correctional rehabilitation. Uh, even though he didn't do, you know, the practical work, he he, he wrote about it and mm -hmm. and was a strong voice uh, in in the field. Mm -hmm. And through Frank, I started to meet people like uh, Paul Jandro and Don Andrews and and the Canadians that were really challenging this. Nothing works. Mm -hmm. And we had a big project. And the state asked an interesting question. They said, you know, we're going to create these different programs. And they're all going to kind of look the same. And what if we find that one works and the others don't? You know, we, we want to know why. And so I thought about that. And uh, I brought Paul in. We brought him in uh, and did some work with Paul. And he started to train us on, on kind of... Uh, the work they were doing around R&R &R and, and, and program assessment. And then we started going out. And I remember the first time I went, I was asked, one of my colleagues, um, like ACA was in town in Cincinnati, and, and uh, there was a breakfast meeting, and she couldn't make it. And, and she said, can you go and talk? And so I went, and most of the folks there were kind of private provider, halfway house folks, people like that. And, I talked about program assessment and what we thought went into good programs. And this one guy in the back of the room, he said, I want you to come look at my programs. And I said, well, you know, I, no, no, when can you come? You know, mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So I went, we assessed his programs, they were god awful, you know, and uh, gave him a report. And to his credit, he said, okay, now I want to fix them. Well, okay, you tell somebody what they're doing isn't working. Mm -hmm. And now, what do you do? Walk away, right? right? And so, yeah. we started to do more work in interventions and assessment and, and that kind of mushroom. And then I got hooked up with NIC, National Institute of Corrections. And at the time, they were doing a lot of, uh, uh, they would bring in teams from around the country to Colorado and they do a week long kind of uh, uh, workshops, and it was me and Don Andrews, Pat Van Voris, sometimes it was Barry Glick, and, and different people that would come in and, and, and do it. And I, I realized that there was this tremendous um, need to help the field, and I didn't think criminology was doing a particularly good job of that. Um, they were talking to themselves, uh, programs, it's easy to critique them, it's a lot harder to fix them. Mm -hmm. and, and so that really, that theme of my work probably started in the, in the mid-90s and has continued today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think part of, and as you know I speak a lot, I, I, I do a lot of travel and a lot of work, and, and part of it is I think it's because there's still not a lot of people doing that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm particularly, you know, uh, uh, skilled at it. Uh, some might say otherwise, but but I really think it's just there's still this big demand mm -hmm. to 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 help them do things that are going to be more effective. Yeah. Um, walk walk us through. You know, you've you obviously been at, at University of Cincinnati for a long time. You've seen a lot of changes in terms of the uh, the academic programming. Yeah. Um, Give us, a, give us a sense of, of what, what the sort of the exclamation points in terms of program development um, yeah. of particular note, of course, you mentioned yeah. already the doctoral program, but yeah. uh, how, how has the, the program at, at UC, the yeah. criminal justice programming at UC evolved over the last 30 plus yeah. years? Well, that's a great question. When I, uh, you know, like most graduate students, you know, when I came out, I thought I should only go to the best universities and you know and I'd apply to them and sometimes I'd get a nice letter back and of course then you start getting desperate then I'm applying to Guam and you know all over the, the place but uh, I went out to California and I worked on a project um, with Harry for a few months and um, you know California is, is a is a great state it's a beautiful state there's there's 
no doubt, and, and they offered me a job out in San Jose, and I was very, very tempted. Uh, in fact, I tell everybody, it was my biggest regret I didn't take the job, buy a house, sell it a couple years later, and get the hell out. But anyway, I turned them down, and I ended up at UAB. And UAB was, a, was an established program. It, it, uh, it had uh, been, you know, had some people had come through it. And, and I was happy there, but I was from Ohio. I wanted, you know, I had family in Ohio. My wife was from Ohio. And so I got the job at Cincinnati. Cincinnati, at the time, we were a program. Uh, so not, not, a, not, a, not, not a department, I, I not a department. Okay. No, we were a program in a college, a small college of community service. We were upper division only. So you were only juniors and seniors, mm -hmm. and we had a very small master's program. If you were a master's student, we could give you a scholarship, but you had to go full time and all the classes were at night. Right. So I came in at Cincinnati, uh, Larry Travis and I were hired at the same time. It was a small department, uh, Bob Mills had founded it, Bob Mills in November of that year uh, had a brain tumor and he died by April. So uh, we were... Um, I think down to four or five faculty. Um, the university made a decision to shut down the college. They had to find us a home. <clears throat> they ended up putting us in what was then the College of Education, which didn't make much sense, but to be honest, nobody really wanted us. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we were there as a program within a larger uh, um, department. There were four or five other programs. In 1985, the dean decided to reorganize, and we actually became the department at that point. So we were an independent department. We had about seven faculty. And you needed department uh, head. I, I was yeah. I was all program coordinator, and then became department head. Uh, <coughs> we were allowed to admit freshmen into the program. So because we understood, we always had the goal of having. And we were, I think, back. Larry and I came in 1980, and I think in 82 we hired Frank Cullen, and then Pat Van Boris and Bob Langworthy, and we started uh, to, to bring in people. And we always thought we could be the best program in the country. I mean, it's a funny story. We had a meeting with the provost once. There was some uh, funding initiative, and we wanted to compete for it, and we went to see the provost. and and uh, Frank and I, and he said, well, I'm, 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 I can't support this at this time. And I was a little irritated and I said, well, you know what, We're, I'm gonna be here long after you're gone and I'm not going anywhere. And he, to his credit, he said, you're right. So we, we got ushered out by the vice provost and this woman. Uh, and she said to me and Frank, she said, look, it, you're a shitty little program on the backside of campus. <laughs> Frank looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, well, Frank, she's right, right? Um, we're no longer a shitty little program on the backside of campus, is all I can yeah. say. Uh, <coughs> we, uh, we became a department. We knew that we had to have a strong base of students, so we were allowed to admit as freshmen. Our, our base became bigger. We became a bigger program. Uh, Frank, I think, around then took over as, under, as graduate director, mm -hmm. started to really market and, and increase the master's students coming in the program. A couple years later, for whatever reason, I don't remember, they wanted to merge some other units. They went from seven departments to, I think, four, so they called us divisions. I, I always told them I never knew what a division was. It was smaller than a battalion, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but bigger than a company. Right? So we were for many years a division of yeah. criminal and is justice. And this, is this late 80s, early 90s? This is late, in the 90s, 90s probably. Uh, right. Probably in the early 90s, early 90s. we became a division. Okay. In 91, it must have been 90, 91, we decided we wanted to get a PhD program. And um, we only had 10 faculty. Uh, we put our proposal, it was a great proposal, you have to go through a very elaborate process, state, and, and we were successful. We, we were able to admit, I think we admitted four students our first year. Which was 91 uh, or 92? Yeah, it was like January. We, we, we admitted them in the fall, but we didn't, the university let us do that, we didn't officially start until January. Um, 
we moved into new space, so we had a uh, nice space, new renovated offices on the front side of campus. <laughs> so yeah, hell with her. But anyway, um, and we started to build. Uh, Bob Langworthy and I actually, he was a graduate director at that point, and we realized most. I think a lot of doctoral programs don't understand. You get a doctoral program. And the university might give you some assistantships. Let's say they give you five assistantships, right? That's great the first year. What are you going to do the second? It's only going to give you the same five, right? And now you've got new students coming in. So we realized right away that to really program, it took more than just good faculty. You had to have money. You had to support people. So we started going after grants, small grants. Anybody wanted any work done, uh, we did it. Um, we then um, became a school, gee, I'd have to look at the timeline, probably in the, you know, 2010 or 11 or something like that. We became a, a school. The, the, the dean uh, decided then to, again, a part of the reorganization, they were going to create uh, schools. There was a college they shut down that included paralegal studies. We took them in. For a while, we took in another a substance abuse uh, program and subsequently gave them the counseling. So we became a school. Uh, we were growing all the time as a faculty. We had created a research center, I think, when you were there. Mm -hmm. So back, what was that, mid -90s? That was mid-90s, yeah. In the mid-90s, we created a center to more or less serve as a, a place for faculty to house projects. Mm -hmm. We created uh, <clears throat> Corrections Institute, I think in 2001, we got a grant from the state. A few years later, we created uh, what was then called the Police Institute, now called the Institute for Crime Science. Um, now we're, I think, I think we have 26 full-time faculty. I have 20-some full-time staff, so we're a very large uh, operation. We do about 12 million a year in external funding. We fund 65 or so doctoral students. So it's a very big school. It, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> just from where we started to where we're at now uh, has, has really been a, a, a hell of a ride. It's, it's been, uh, and we've had you know a lot of support over the years from various people at the university, some not so much. But um, uh, great colleagues, good faculty. I think one of the hallmarks of Cincinnati is that we really feel like we're a family and, and our, both our students and our faculty uh, will do things for the school. I, I, I get emails all the time from faculty if I need something done and they'll say, if you need this done, we're happy to do it. And, and, and I think that helps set us apart. Mm -hmm. Sure. What do, you, uh, what do you look back on in terms of uh, what gives you the most what are you the most proud of, uh, both in terms of your, 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 let's call it your research agenda and then yeah. your program development? From those two worlds, which are, what, what do you consider your most Well, uh, first of all, I don't think either of those are my pro most important. I think most important, I think as faculty get older, and, and Frank and I talk about this a lot, I, I think when you look back, you know, 20 years from now, nobody's you know, going to remember, you know, cite you or worry about what you wrote. That's, you know, very few people. Um, does that occur to? Uh, first, it's our students. You know, the, the students like you and others that we we hopefully helped uh, uh, give them some direction and, and get them started in, in the business. Uh, I think that's what I'm most proud of are, are the students. Um, the second is probably the the the, the work at the university is, is building a program, something we could all be proud of. Uh, I hope that legacy lasts for a long time. But again, not because we did it, but because we can now influence students and, and influence the field and help move things forward. And then I guess third is probably my work uh, in the field with agencies. We, we've had, for example, in Ohio, uh, we do a lot of work with the Department of Youth Services. And when I started, uh, we did some studies for them back in the 90s. They had 3,500 kids locked up in 10 institutions. And um, 
we started something called Reclaim Ohio. Uh, we worked with them. We helped them create risk assessment. We did more studies for them. Today, they have less than 500 kids in three institutions. I never thought they'd get mm -hmm. to that point. Um, we played a small role in that, but I'm very proud of that. That you know, the data helped convince them that we were doing harm to kids. They were better served in the community. We could build good community programs. We, we, not only do we help them, we, we actually have the contract to monitor the programs, to train them and to coach them and to give quality assurance. And uh, if you look at that, that's, that's changed the footprint uh, of a state that, you know, had no problem locking up, you know, a couple thousand, three thousand kids a kids. year. So, yeah. So I'm very proud of that, the work we've done there. And we do that kind of work in a lot of places, but we've really, because we've been able to do it for 30 years in Ohio, we've really been able to see it. And changes of leadership, changes of administration, they've continued to call on us to help them. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of that work that my staff have done there as well. Has there been, uh, is, there any, <clears throat> is there any aspect of your work, uh, either one thing in particular or sort of an ongoing uh, situation that you have found is considered controversial like what 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 do, you, what do you consider to be the most controversial aspect of your of your work you know so I used to say you want to lean into the wind mm -hmm. not piss in the wind you know and, and so uh, I lean um, I, you know there are always challengers yeah. there's always people that um, challenge the what you're doing I th when we started and when Dawn and I, Dawn and I would go around the country, Dawn Andrews and I, who's a, you know, was a giant in the field and really is, is, was instrumental in this, all this work. Um, I, I'm just, you know, standing on people like that shoulders. And, and at the time we were in a lock them up, get tough kind of a, a, a phase. And we spent all of our time trying to convince them that we actually knew something about correctional rehabilitation. That's changed. I don't do that. I don't have to do that anymore. Most people believe that. The challenge now is implementation. How do you implement it? How do you take the research and turn it into practice? And I won't say it's controversial, but it's tough. You still have people that think the best way is to just lock them up, or the best way is to, you know, uh, take away whatever privileges they have, or, or, and so forth. And so, you you get pushback. I mean, you get pushback on that. You also get pushback. It's interesting. It's not just from the the, the that side of the of the aisle, but a lot of treatment providers. Right? You're challenging what they do. You know, they've been doing it this way for 20 years and, you know, they want to do this talk therapy and this, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, crap that they do. And now you're coming in and you're saying, that doesn't work. And so I've been called a lot of names. I, I get, le you know, we, we write, we do assessments of programs and hell, the, the, the letters they write me are longer than the reports, you know. I'm not illegitimate despite what they write about, me, you know. Uh, <laughs> And, and so there, there's, it's not so much on the academic side, because again, I don't think most academics get all that involved in, you know, there, there are people write, you know, you'll see people write, you know, this model's not, we should be doing this, but, but not too many people pay attention to that in the field. Uh, in the field, you get a lot of, there is some controversy. I wouldn't call it controversy. I would, I would say it's more about resistance and pushback. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if I'm, as I'm a controversial fellow uh, in that regard. Well, when you uh, when you th when you think about that work and sort of the systemic change that you're that you're referring to, what is wh what's the most important factor that's going to sustain that long term? And I, when I say long term, I mean decades going yeah. through, going forward. What's what needs to happen to sustain that work? Uh, well, I don't know about decades. I won't be around decades, but uh, <clears throat> I go in with the idea that there's a lot of people in the correctional side that are. Uh, I won't call them snake oil salesmen, but <clears throat> they make a lot of money selling something to an agency. Sometimes it's you know it's a good curriculum or good this or good that, but they control everything. You know they they uh, <clears throat> you can't get trainers trained. You can't get and so my our approach at UC has been we're going to give you what we develop. Mm -hmm. 
and we're going to help you build capacity so that <clears throat> we'll train you, we'll train trainers, we'll even train master trainers. We will work with your leadership. We will help organize you into uh, uh, groups that look at quality assurance or look at risk assessment. And, and so the idea is to create a, a model or a paradigm within that agency that they can sustain over time. Because what happens a lot of places, they'll bring somebody in, they'll spend a lot of money to get trained, um, Everybody's excited. Three years later, they have 20% new staff. They don't have the money to train anymore, and pretty soon fidelity goes to hell. Or they go to some conference and somebody's talking about, you know, we ought to be doing, uh, you know, yoga for offenders because that'll reduce recidivism. That seems next like thing, a good idea. Next thing they know, they're buying mats, you know, right. and laying them on the floor. Uh, kind of thing. I keep telling you, get a model. You, know, you have a model. You follow the model. Um, it's not that it can't improve and change, but you, you, and you want to have the capacity so when you hire new people, they're not what they're doing what they did at the last place they were. They're doing your model. So I, that's a hard one. It's very difficult. Where we've had the most success has been because of strong leadership and, and leadership that's been there long enough to, to get them to that point. If you have every six months a new program director or new, you know, somebody comes in, we're going in a different direction. It, it's very hard yeah. uh, to sustain uh, to sustain the work and getting people to just think different. I tell them all the time, I'm selling you an idea. I'm not selling you. I don't have anything in my bag. You know, I'm getting you to think about how you deal with people and where you get the most effect. So. What's a, what advice do you have uh, for for young scholars uh, that, that are that are going into or want to follow in your in, in your footsteps? What what are some of the key things that? Well, I always remember you and a lot of a lot of the young ones would say they wanted to be just like me, but they didn't want to work as hard. I never, uh, I never yeah, said. Yeah, no, you I didn't. But that. some of them did, and I thought, well, then you won't be like me. Um, you know, the great again, the great thing about our business is. You want to come in and sit in your office and look at big data sets, you can do that. You want to come in and, 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 and uh, uh, go out and do ethnographical work, you can do that. You know, if, if you want to be an administrator, you know, I, I have lunches with the doctoral students uh, uh, every month and different ones. And, and I always ask them, where do you see yourself in five years or ten years? And, you know, do you see yourself as a department head or as a dean? And a lot of them are no, no, no. But now, I mean, now look at our graduates. We have department heads, we have deans. I mean, so I know that some of them are going to go down that path. They're going to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. If they want to do the kind of work that I do, I will help them do that. You know, um, my advice to them is learn as much as you can in graduate school because it's a hell of a lot harder once you get your first job. Uh, hone some skills, your teaching skills. Why? Because, you know, what I learned in the classroom, you know, and what I started to learn from Cy Dennett's was how to get an audience, you know, and how to read an audience and how to talk to them in a way. And, and, and people that really know it can, can take it down and, and make it understandable, right? And, and so you, when I learned those skills in the classroom, so you want to get out, you want to talk to a thousand people in a, in a room, well, you start with a classroom. Because uh, trust me, if you can hold the attention of 18-year-olds, right, you <laughs> sure the hell can do people in the field. So, I, you know, and here's why. You know, a lot of students come in and want to be researchers. Well, that's great, but most, if they're going to go to a university, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to teach. teach. That's a big part of that. I used to teach you know, three cor courses every every quarter, and then I do an overload because I needed the money. So I taught four courses a a, a quarter a for for you know 15 years or something. So I tell them to learn their craft. I tell them if they if they do want to change the field, whatever field, policing, corrections, whatever you know, you got to leave the office. You know, you, you gotta, you can't be afraid. I think a lot of academics wanna, uh, there's a lot of safety at the university. 
-hmm. you know, lecturing students, you know, they're sitting at your feet. You have control. Yeah, Yeah, you have control. Go out in front of 300 correctional officers Mm -hmm. and tell them, you know, uh, that they could do things differently. You know, go out in front of the parole officers, all have guns in there, you know. tough guys uh, and women and and so and that's not easy but if you want to do that work you've got to learn how to do that um i have students we have, I have a lot of doctoral students that you know they come to uc and they say i want to do what you do okay we'll help you do that i have some that come and say well i don't you know i thought i wanted to do that but i really want to do you know study it fine we'll help you do that too mm-hmm. so it's a different field than when we start. Mm-hmm. When I, you know, my first ASC meeting was 1977 in Atlanta, and I think that was the first year they got to like a thousand people. There were, you know, and, and prior to that, those meetings were, you know, a couple hundred people. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody knew everybody. You had a handful of journals. You know, it's a different field today. You come to these meetings with thousands of people everybody's you know there's tons of outlets you're, you're integrated with other fields it's a lot harder to kind of establish yourself mm-hmm. than than when i started so you know decide what you want to do become an expert in it learn some you know learn how to be a good teacher i always tell them i have rules i give my students so one of them is treat your students the way you want them to be treated mm-hmm. so many of them go in and they you know, they all of a sudden they're, they're doing this and that. And I say, is that how you want somebody to treat you? So, you know, if you follow those rules, I think you end up you end up okay. Yeah. Do you still have your the, the rules? Do you still I still hand got out your my rules. rules. For, for I, I still got my rules. Yeah, for all of them. most of them they break, but yeah. but I do give them my rules. You know, stay out of politics yeah. and and you know take care of your students and 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 uh, things like that. But uh, it's human nature. To, yeah. You know. Talk therapy doesn't work very well. Doesn't work very no, well. No, doesn't work for anybody. Yeah. And I, yeah. Yeah, I still have that paper. Um, <laughs> do uh, uh, switching uh, a little bit back to the to, to the field of correctional practice. Yeah. What uh, in your view right now? Uh, what are we What are we currently ignoring? Or to, if I could put it another way, what part of correctional practice do you consider to be the least developed right now that needs the most attention? Yeah, so many areas. I, I think our institutions are still um, um, real challenges, uh, what we do in our institutions. Um, we still have too many inmates, we don't have enough programs, we don't have good programs. That's a challenge and that's a tough one. That's always going to be a hard one uh, to overcome. I think what we don't have enough of um, in the community side, we're doing some new work at Cincinnati now and and because after all these years of working and develop programs and and it's a long story I won't get into it but but I got involved in a project and and I had to come up with a way to provide support for people when they came out of uh, in this case a, a jail facility and there had been a study done, a couple of friends of mine had done a study in Pennsylvania looking at parolees that made it. And, and one of the things that struck me was the, 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 the parolees that, that were successful all said they had somebody they could go to. And I, I got thinking about programs, right? How, you know, you go to a program, I don't care what it is about, you might get some out of it. But my guess is, the real change that most of us have gone through in our lives has been because of other people. And so the idea is, and where I think there's a need is, we've got to do a better job of, of giving family members and friends and what we call influencers some skills um, to help those people that are coming out of prison, that are getting in trouble. The people that are going to surround the offender. The people that are going to surround Social. the offender. Yeah. Uh, Family we, or we, we actually have a model we're testing it now. But, but again, because I think, look at your own life. Look at the questions you're asking. Who influenced yeah. you? Why did you get here, right? And, and, and so if we can identify those people and train them, and I don't mean, you know, stuff we do now at mentoring, which doesn't have that big of an but really teach us some core skills. 
so that whenever they're interacting with that person, they can work on a risky situation. They can address some of their thinking. Uh, uh, I think that's needed. And, and we'll call it, for lack of a better term, you know, uh, some family-based intervention. It's more than family. But if you look at the juvenile world, we have models. We have functional family therapy. We have MST. We have models that work with family. You don't see that in the adult side. You just don't see it's, it. Yeah, it's not there. It's not there. And, and I think that's we're, 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 think, we're going to create, spend all this money on a program where we fight to get them there. We fight to get them to pay attention. Um, let's go where they're at. And so that, that, to me, I think is a need. We still need to change people's, you know, I always tell people two things. One, if you think, it, you think it's easy to change, change, try changing yourself. It's hard to change. It's hard to change our behavior. And I'm always amazed when I deal with probation and parole officers who want the offender to change. But they don't want to change, right? right? They don't want to change how they think. They don't want to change their skills. Yeah, yeah. And, and so Brian Lovins, who, you know, you know, and is one of my former students, now works down at uh, deputy director in Harris County. And Brian, uh, you know, worked for me for a long time. He's now a big administrator in charge of a big, big community corrections agency. And he said to me, he said, here's, here's the problem. He said, we are developing material and techniques for coaches and we're giving it to referees. Right? Yeah. Patient parole officers are trained to be referees. What's a referee do? Enforce the rules. Yeah. What do referees do? Throw you out of the game. What do referees do? And they never are, they're trained not to say good job, right. great shot. Sure. sure. What's a coach do? Teaches. Shapes. He reinforces. He shapes. Yeah. Right? We want them to be coaches. They've been referees. Yeah. It's a big challenge changing them. Um, so I think those are the challenges. I'm still very optimistic. I think we've come a long way. Anybody think we haven't come a long way? Weren't there when we started. So I, I think we're we're getting there. Yeah. What about in criminal justice education? Any liabilities there? Anything that we're we're currently uh, missing, sort of missing the boat on? When you think about the undergrad, when you're <coughs> turning out undergraduates yeah, that are majoring yeah. in criminal justice? Yeah, we're missing the boat uh, a lot of ways. Um, <coughs> I don't think, I think we, we do a good job with knowledge. I don't think we do a good job with skills. Uh, <clears throat> we, we might do an internship. They might, we require that some programs do, they get a little experience. But I don't think they're getting <clears throat> uh, the skills that, that, that they need often. Uh, and I don't mean training them on some, you know, technical like tool. The agencies can do that sure. kind of stuff, but but really getting them understand, you know, problem solving and critical mm -hmm. thinking and, and the kind of things that <clears throat> uh, will make them successful. I think we do a better job of that. Um, I'm a little worried at the graduate level. <clears throat> I think um, big data is the, is the latest and data analytics, and I see a lot of very smart people that um, know how to mine the data and know how to crunch the numbers, but they don't really understand the substantive. They don't understand what's behind it. Um, you know, in, in the old days, the, you were a criminologist, you worked here, you, you understood the people that you were dealing with, you understood the criminal behavior, you understood. I think we lose in some of them. I'm a little worried that technology's making it easier for to do some things mm -hmm. without knowing what's what's behind that, what's behind that data. And uh, I think that's going to be a, a challenge. A challenge you know? in the education. Yeah, in the education world. Yeah. And, and you know, and it's a big field. I mean, there's mm -hmm. room for lots of people, but. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just see the interview the people we interview now for for positions and a lot of them get up and show you all this data when you start asking them questions they don't know what the hell's behind mm -hmm. all they know is well this is connected to this and can't you see that yeah you know yeah yeah anything else you'd like to add as it relates to the field or mm -hmm. education well I, I, I think the other thing we don't I certainly don't do a, 
well enough job with our young academics, uh, people coming out, is we, we prepare them to work in, to study, to be good scholars, sometimes to be good teachers. Mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, and, and we're probably as guilty of this as anyone, that we don't teach them always the professional role and how universities work and how they're organized and, and a lot of them come back after a year and so gee why don't you tell me that you know I got to deal with this jackass department here I got to deal with this I may, have, I may have asked you yeah and I'm on like all these before. committees and I get a lot of them I, I do a little therapy uh, every month with a couple now that are department heads you know what do you do when you know and uh, I, you know and, and <clears throat> you know that's a tough one we're not you know every place is different and you can't always do sure. that but I, I think uh, I'd like to do a better job of that too to, to kind of get them get them prepared for what they're going to go out there because you know they all go out and they're going to you know save the world and they're going to have these great colleagues at their university and the, the dean's going to you know bestow money see, yeah, and see how valuable they are see how much away. money you can right? give them you know <laughs> and, and you need more for your research you know kind of thing and and uh, and it just isn't you know and universities have changed their their businesses they're they're in they're bureaucratic they're in, in a lot of I hate to say it, a lot of academics just don't know how to navigate that and, and get chewed up a little bit. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can teach it, but, but I at least like to think I could at least help them understand, you know, what they're going to deal with. You know. Well, Ed, this has been a real pleasure. I want to thank you very much for sharing, sharing a little bit about your life and career. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank uh, ASC and ACJS for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely.